So we have today Jermaine, and uh, Jermaine just joined UNSW, the photoluminescence group, uh, a few weeks ago in September, and we are quite excited to have him here with us. Uh, he has very, very uh, uh, different uh, background. So he did his PhD in France, and that was on disynthesized solar cells. And then he worked a few years as a postdoc in the University of Luxembourg on CZTS, and that will be the topic of his uh, talk. Uh, with us in the PL group, uh, German will focus on uh, develop new characterization for since film solar cells. Uh, it's a bit different from the silicon one that was the focus of the group. So German, first welcome to UNSW. It's great to have you here. And Thanks. we are looking forward to hear about your work on the, in the postdoc. Please welcome German. Thank you, Ziv, for the introduction. As you mentioned, uh, now I'm working here at uh, postdoc uh, in the PL uh, group, and I'm uh, doing PL imaging and PL on Synfilm uh, solar cell. So I will be very happy to discuss with the member of the Synfilm uh, team about any interest about PL or PL imaging on their devices. Uh, so today the, <coughs> the talk is about my work uh, at the laboratory for photovoltaics at the University of Luxembourg, and it's about uh, CZTSSE. So uh, let's first uh, have a look at these materials and why are they interesting uh, for uh, photovoltaics. Uh, first, CZTS stands for uh, copper 2 tin um, zinc tin uh, sulfur 4 and has a band gap of uh, 1.5 electron volt. Its uh, selenite counterpart, CZTSE, has a band gap of uh, 1 electron volt and by playing with the sulfur selenide uh, alloying, you can tune the band gap of uh, CZTSSE between uh, 1 and 1 1.5 electron volt, which uh, covers the optimum range for photovoltaics. In addition, this material are direct band gaps, so they have a high absorption uh, coefficient above the band gap, and the metallic elements are non-toxic and earth abundant. This is why this material uh, um, attracted a lot of interest for photovoltaics. The solar cell uh, structure is directly uh, copied from uh, the uh, CIGS technology, which stands for uh, copper indium gallium diselenide. And the uh, back contact consists of uh, molybdenum uh, thin film. The CZTS uh, SE layer is the P-type absorber, which is uh, usually around 1 to 2 micron thick. And the buffer layer is the uh, N-type heteron junction partner. Uh, usually, uh, cadmium sulfide is used for this layer. The front con contact is made uh, using a uh, highly end up transparent conductive oxide, usually aluminum dot zinc oxide. And um, this uh, TCO is contacted with a uh, nickel uh, aluminum grid. If you look at the efficiency record, uh, it steadily increased from 1996 to uh, 2013, where IBM set the uh, record efficiency to 12.6%, which is uh, the still the current record uh, for CZTSC. Of course, 12.6% um, uh, is not great for photovoltaics, and when you look at the efficiency, um, here uh, expressed as a percentage of the Shockley equalizer limit, and if you compare this, uh, the efficiency of the CZTSSE, uh, which are the colored points on that graph, with uh, its uh, cousin technology, CIGS, which are the black star here, you see a huge gap, gap uh, in efficiency. So let's break down um, the efficiency and look at uh, the limiting factor. For the field factor and the short circuit current density, you see that uh, CZTSSC can perform uh, beyond 80% uh, <coughs> of its optimal uh, value, while for the open circuit voltage, you have only uh, barely 60%. So this is uh, clearly the limiting factor for CZTSSC, and we need to improve the voltage and decrease the voltage deficits uh, for 
this technology. Now, uh, one uh, notorious reason for uh, high uh, VOC deficit is uh, band tailing. On your left hand side, you can see um, the nice uh, empirical correlation illustrated by the Wolf uh, between <coughs> VOC deficit and Urbar energy, which uh, describes the amount of uh, the band tailing in the material. This is well known that. Uh, uh, CZTSSC have a uh, huge band tailing and uh, <coughs> you can see it uh, easily when you compare the energy of the band gap and the PL. You see a strong, a strong redshift of the PL compared to uh, the band gap energy. One uh, reason for band tailing is disorder. So the CZTSSC materials uh, crystallize in the castorite structure, which is uh, displayed on your left hand side. And in this uh, tetragonal structure, you have uh, two copper and zinc planes, which are located at one quarter and three quarter of the C-axis. Because copper and uh, zinc uh, cation are uh, very similar, they can exchange position in the lattice by creating copper on zinc and zinc on copper defect complexes, which lead to uh, the disordered castorite, where you have a random uh, occupation of the copper and zinc sites in those two copper and zinc planes. This disorder uh, was first reported um, in 2011. Because copper and zinc cation are uh, very similar, it's actually uh, not possible to probe this disorder by conventional X-ray diffraction, but instead you have to use uh, more exotic uh, characterization techniques like uh, neutron diffraction, nuclear magnetic resonance, or anomalous X-ray diffraction. This disorder is uh, also uh, predicted by uh, theoretical calculation of defects because of the very low formation energy of the copper on zinc and zinc on copper defect complex. It's expected that this copper zinc disorder uh, will have an effect on the band gap. Uh, first, because it, uh, <coughs> the disorder increased the unit cell volume. As you can see on your left hand side here, where you have the lattice uh, parameter as a function of temperature, you see a bump here for the C axis around 260 degrees, which is due to uh, the order disorder transition. And also it's predicted that um, the valence band should rise when you have a high concentration of uh, this copper, the zinc on copper and copper on zinc defect complex. So we first look at the band gap of the material and how it changes with this uh, order disorder transition. We adopt a sequential approach where we first uh, anneal the sample at a constant temperature and then we quench the sample by uh, rapidly uh, cooling down. And uh, then the band gap of the material was measured by spectrophotometry at room temperature. On your left hand side, you can see the tox plot for direct band gap evaluation. And you can see the massive uh, change of uh, band gap when we change the, the analytic temperature from uh, 300 degrees to 75 degrees, which corresponds to the change in band gap corresponds uh, around 10% of its value. Now on your right hand side, you have uh, the evolution of the band gap during uh, the sequence. sequence. Uh, we started here and we first uh, increase the, the annealing temperature to 300 degrees, then we decrease the annealing temperature to 75 degrees, and then we increase again the, the annealing temperature to go back to the starting point. And the most uh, striking feature here is that uh, the change is completely reversible and it's also continuous, which uh, strongly supports that we are observing the copper and zinc uh, order-disorder phase transition, which is a second-order phase transition. Now, we uh, wanted to um, evaluate uh, the impact of the annealing on uh, the copper and zinc disorder. So we uh, use a long range order parameter, S, which depends 
only on the probability to find the copper atom on the copper site. And this probability is uh, normalized using the, the atomic uh, fraction of copper in the copper zinc planes, uh, such that the coefficient, the order parameter, uh, goes from 1 for the perfectly ordered structure to 0 for the completely disordered structure. Then we, uh, we use vinyl models to calculate the evolution of this order parameter during the uh, annealing quenching sequence. And um, we um, consider two different mechanisms. First, we consider the direct exchange between copper and zinc. And we also consider the vacancy assisted uh, exchange mechanism. Uh, they give similar results, so today I will just uh, present the results for the direct exchange. And <coughs> so the, the change of the order parameter during this uh, annealing uh, quenching sequence depends on uh, three parameters. First, F is um, the frequency of the vibrational mode associated with the copper zinc exchange. U is the uh, activation energy while V here is uh, a term that depends on the uh, uh, interaction energy, uh, which in the Vinance model is uh, limited to the first neighbors. So this term depends how we'll change this interaction energy uh, before and after you exchange the copper and zinc. And this term uh, defines the critical temperature. The critical temperature is um, Above this temperature, the system will go uh, will goes to complete disorder, while when you are uh, below this critical temperature, then the order starts to rise. Here again, you can see uh, the evolution of the band gap for the full uh, sequence, and here the uh, evolution of the order parameter. We, um, adjusted this, uh, the value of those three uh, parameters in order to uh, uh, fit uh, the change in band gap with the change in order parameter. And from, uh, from this, we did deduce that the critical temperature for the pure selenide CZTSE is 200 degrees. You remember from literature, for the pure sulfide compound, it was uh, 260 degrees. Because we have a good agreement between the, the order parameter and uh, the band gap evolution during the sequence, uh, we can use directly the band gap as an order parameter. In order uh, to confirm that we were looking at the copper zinc uh, order disorder phase transition, we also use uh, Raman spectroscopy. And if you compare the Raman uh, spectra of um, um, CZTSE in the ordered state and the disordered state, uh, you see um, two features. The first one um, is because you, uh, uh, when you disorder the sample, you create a lot of copper on zinc and zinc on copper defect complex. You uh, reduce the phonon current length and therefore you uh, confine the phonon in a smaller volume. In that case, you will expect uh, to have contribution of uh, phonon with, uh, outside the zone center. And to predict the behavior of your mode, then you can look at uh, how it changes the frequency of uh, your phonon mode uh, when you go away from the gamma point uh, of the Brillouin zone. And for the main mode of the Kesterite, uh, the frequency uh, goes to lower um, value when you uh, go away from the gamma point and therefore you expect your uh, shift uh, your sorry your uh, peak to shift to lower frequency when you uh, increase the disorder but also you uh, expect an asymmetrical broadening towards the lower frequency and this is uh, exactly what we see for the main uh, uh, case right mode uh, the second feature that we uh, observe here is uh, related to a change in uh, symmetry for the perfectly uh, ordered Kesterite, uh, you expect uh, three A modes, uh, which are the main mode uh, of the Kesterite. And uh, so you have one here. 
And here, actually, in, the, in this peak that correspond to the order sample, you have a clear shoulder. So you have uh, two uh, other Raman peaks. So those are the three A mode of the case right. Now, when you uh, completely disorder the um, sample, you make those two uh, sites uh, equivalent, and then you introduce two uh, mirror uh, symmetries. And because you change the space group, then uh, one of the three A mode of the case right become Raman inactive. And this is why, for the disordered sample, we can actually uh, fit this mode with uh, only uh, uh, one uh, Lorentzian. Okay. Um, <coughs> also, the change in Raman spectra that we see uh, are uh, continuous and reversible when you uh, uh, order and disorder again uh, one sample. So this is uh, strongly supporting that we are uh, looking at the copper uh, zinc order disorder phase transition. To summarize this first part, um, we saw that uh, ordering increases the band gap by 10%. And the uh, critical temperature for the order disorder transition in pure selenide castorite is 200 degrees, uh, which means you need to have a very good control of your uh, cooling rate below 200 degrees when you, uh, after the deposition of your sample, because this is uh, where the ordering uh, starts uh, to rise. In your sample. Also, we have uh, <coughs> seen that the band gap can be used as a secondary order uh, parameter, which is very handy because now if you want to compare the order state of uh, two samples with the same composition, you don't necessarily need to do a uh, neutron diffraction, but you can just look at the band gap. And also, uh, the Raman uh, spectrum reflects the change that you expect from the Copper and uh, zinc order disorder transition. In the second part, we uh, look at the effect on the device. And there, where um, the CZTS E material was deposited by co evaporation, and after uh, deposition, we use uh, two uh, post deposition treatments. One uh, in situ in the lock, lock chamber of our MBE system, or ex situ using a tube furnace. And we apply uh, two different uh, treatments. The first one yeah, okay. uh, the first one is meant to uh, increase the order state and consists of um, low temperature annealing. Of course, the lower the temperature, the higher the order states you can reach. But because the time constant needed to reach uh, equilibrium um, increase exponentially when you decrease the temperature, you uh, have a practical limitation for the ordering states that you can reach. And in our case, we uh, use uh, annealing at 100 degrees. And therefore, even if the samples are called odd, they are not uh, perfectly ordered, they are just partially ordered. The second um, type of uh, treatment that we use is uh, disordering treatment, which consists of annealing the sample at uh, above the critical temperature to induce complete disorder, and then the sample is uh, quenched in order to freeze uh, this disordered state. Um, of course, you can combine those uh, two uh, treatments in sequence, and uh, because the, the order disorder phase transition is uh, completely reversible, you should expect the same results. Uh, for example, if you compare a disorder sample with uh, one that has been order and disorder. So by playing uh, with these two uh, post-deposition treatment and the ex situ, in situ annealing, uh, we generate uh, different uh, series of samples. And here the, the disordered samples are plotted in the shade of red or orange, while the ordered samples are plotted in the shade of blue or green. And first, if you look at the short circuit current density, you see that uh, for most of the series, the um, value li lie in a very uh, narrow range. 
except for those two uh, ordered samples. But if you look at the open circuit voltage, uh, you can see it's uh, spread out and the disordered uh, sample have a lower VOC than the ordered one. Remember that VOC is the critical parameter for uh, this technology. Um, however, we could not improve the VOC deficit by playing with the copper zinc order disorder. Remember that we can use the band gap as an order parameter. So um, you can see that the VOC deficit stays nearly constant when you uh, change the order or disorder state of the castorite. Now looking at the current density and uh, quantum efficiency. For the ex situ treated samples, uh, we saw that uh, actually the GSC uh, does not change so much when you do the order or disorder treatment. It's because the loss in current that you expect from uh, when you increase the band gap by disordering the sample is partially compensated by a better collection at long wavelength. Um, in this case, it's attributed to a change in doping. And when you order the sample, you decrease the doping density, so you uh, increase the width of the uh, spare ch charge region, which helps to collect the carrier generated at the back of the device. For the in-situ treated sample, which is the green line here, you can see that you have a good collection at long, wing, long wavelength, and in this case, it was attributed to an improvement of the diffusion length. Well, then when you apply um, ex situ uh, treatment, you go back uh, to this uh, uh, regime where you see that the um, collection of carrier at long wavelengths is uh, decreased. Um, the change in current and in QE that we see are highly uh, process dependent and are not necessarily re directly related with the copper zinc order disorder transition. And <coughs> uh, for example, if your uh, device has a uh, very nice QE and if you do the ordering treatment, you won't see any improvement of the carrier collection at long wavelengths. And also if you look at the value of the doping when you do um, several order and disorder treatment, you see that it's not completely reversible, so it's not, uh, uh, it's not un at least entirely due to the uh, copper zinc order disorder transition in that case. So to summarize this uh, second part, uh, we saw that uh, using uh, in situ uh, treatments, uh, we could uh, increase the carrier collection length uh, in our process that gave us uh, improvement of the short circuit current. And also we, um, we've seen that uh, ordering the sample increase the band gap and increase the VOC. So those two effects combined increases our, the device of uh, the, the efficiency of our device uh, substantially. But the main problem, which is the VOC deficit, was not affected by the copper uh, zinc ordering or disorder or disordering. So we had a look directly at the band tail because uh, uh, <coughs> we assumed that the, the problem was coming from the band tail. And for the CZTS SC material, usually the best device are obtained with off-stoichiometric sample. And in that case, you have a material which is highly doped, highly compensated. And in this case, the band tailing comes from uh, specially fluctuating band edges. Can, can, can come from uh, two different mechanisms. First, uh, electrostatic uh, potential fluctuation due to charge defects, or fluctuating band gap energy due to uh, defect complexes. The main difference between those two mechanisms is that uh, you can sc screen the electrostatic uh, potential fluctuation by injecting carrier. This is why we looked at uh, photoluminescence. On your left-hand side, you can see um, the behavior of the PL peak 
when you increase the excitation, in this case uh, over uh, almost six order of magnitude, and you can see that you have a strong blue shift. When you increase the temperature, you see that you have a, a strong red shift, and those two behaviors are the, the typical behavior of uh, highly doped, highly compensated uh, semiconductor. If you, for, if you increase the temperature further, then you see that you have a blue shift, and in this case, it's due to a change of uh, uh, transition processes. In order to gain some information about the fluctuation depth of our, um, val of our bandages, we looked at the low energy side of the PL, which reflects the density of states, and we fitted this, uh, this uh <coughs> low energy side with uh, Gaussian distribution and we associated the standard deviation to the fluctuation depth which is uh, reported here for different PL intensity at different uh, temperature. And for the low PL intensity you expect to have uh, both electrostatic uh, fluctuation and band gap fluctuations while uh, when you increase the PL intensity the generated carrier can uh, screen the electrostatic potential and we are left with only the band gap fluctuation. So from the, <coughs> if you look at the difference between low uh, PL intensity and high PL intensity, you can see that the decrease is very limited. So we conclude that the band gap fluctuation is the main uh, mechanism responsible for the band tail in castorite. And from the uh, difference, between those two values, we uh, estimated that it accounts for about two-thirds, and one-third is um, for the electrostatic uh, fluctuations. Because the main uh, band tailing uh, in Kesterite is due to uh, um, band gap fluctuation, uh, we thought maybe that because uh, the copper and, uh, and zinc disorder as an effect on the band gap, it could be uh, the origin of the strong band tailing in Kesserite. So we uh, measured uh, the absor absorption uh, spectra of uh, different samples, and for this we use uh, a PL method that was uh, um, proposed by Dub and Würfel, and we extended this uh, PL method to a uh, thin film using transfer matrix method. And as you can see on the CIS sample, we have a good agreement between uh, the PL uh, uh, spectrum and uh, phototermal deflection spectroscopy. And the, the advantage of PL is uh, being able to resolve deep tails. So on your left hand side, you can see uh, the absorption spectra of uh, three different samples. One disorder, one has grown, and one uh, order. Obviously, you see the shift in band gaps which reflect the change in copper zinc order disorder states and this sample show an OBAR behavior but if you try to um, to use um, a square root behavior above the band gap and uh, OBAR behavior below the band gap doesn't fit instead we uh, all right so uh, instead we use um, Gaussian distribution of band gap together with an um, Ubar tail behavior. So we have two uh, parameters to uh, describe the band tailing in Kesterite, uh, the Ubar energy, which describes the behavior of the deep tails, and uh, sigma, which is the standard deviation of the Gaussian distribution, which uh, describes the rate shift of the band tail uh, behavior, and compared to the band gap. Yeah, okay. Uh, so those two parameters are reported here for um, two uh, different materials, so the sulfoselenide alloy and the pure uh, selenide uh, kesterite. And uh, together with the band gap, you can see that the disordering and ordering treatments effectively change the band gap. So we effectively uh, change the copper zinc uh, other states on the samples, but actually you can you cannot see uh, any uh, trend for uh, the Obar tail, uh, Obar energy, or sigma. 
So we conclude that um, playing with the copper zinc uh, order by post deposition uh, thermal treatment doesn't change the band tailing in castorite. And this is uh, in agreement with what we saw before that uh, we could not uh, change the redshift between band gap and PL, and we also could not improve the VOC deficit in our device by applying the same uh, post deposition uh, treatment. Now, if you look in the literature, actually, a uh, good uh, way to decrease the band tailing in castorite is by alloying. Uh, which at uh, first uh, seems uh, non-intuitive because you would expect uh, uh, alloying disorder. But in these two uh, examples, the copper or zinc were alloyed, alloyed with their corresponding element of the higher period. And the first example comes from UNSW, and they could uh, effectively reduce the band tailing by alloying uh, zinc with cadmium. In that case, cadmium is very uh, different from copper, and they don't really want to exchange uh, site in the <coughs> in the planes. So it uh, decreased the band tailing, improved the VOC deficit, and also reduced the uh, redshift of PL and band gap. The other example, they alloy uh, silver with copper. Once again. Uh, Silver is very different from zinc, and they don't want, don't want to exchange. And they actually could uh, completely get rid of this uh, uh, redshift between band gap and PL. So how we can explain that uh, alloying is a good way to uh, reduce the band tailing in cassarite, but if we play uh, with the copper zinc disorder uh, by post-deposition treatment, we saw no effect on the band tailing. Uh, one element is given by theoretical uh, defect calculation. If you look at the influence of the zinc on copper plus copper on zinc defect complex, which is the defect that we form when we disorder the sample, uh, you see that actually its influence on the band gap is uh, quite weak. Okay? So the fact that we, we see a change in band gap is because when the sample is fully disordered, we have a huge concentration of those defects, and this concentration is one um, defect complex per unit cell for the fully disordered sample. But it also means that if you want to uh, um, specially uh, uh, fluctuate the band gap, you need a rather uh, high concentration difference of those defects from one point to another. So better way to produce uh, fluctuation is to look at defect that has a huge impact on the band gap, because then you need only small uh, uh, variation of the concentration to produce band tailing. And those defects are, uh, as you can see here, they are mostly tin related. And fortunately for the material, they don't form easily, Ex except for uh, this uh, tin on zinc plus two copper on zinc, which has a very low form, uh, um, formation energy, which is this red line here. And this uh, defect complex involves a tin on zinc. And if you look at the formation energy of this tin on zinc alone, without the complex, it's the black line here. So it has a very high formation energy. So actually, you will not form this uh, tin on copper, uh, sorry, this tin on zinc defect if you don't have a lot of uh, copper on zinc available to form the complex. And our proposal is that the band tailing doesn't come from the zinc on copper and copper on zinc uh, defect complex, but this uh, disorder uh, provides a lot of copper on zinc um, defects that are involved in the formation of this detrimental defect. Okay, so to summarize um, this last part, uh, we saw that the nature of the cassurite band tail is uh, uh, mainly due to band gap fluctuation, and by changing the copper zinc ordering by post-deposition treatment annealing, we could not affect the band tailing. Uh, 
in case right. And therefore, we propose that uh, the copper on zinc and zinc on copper is not directly the main cause of this uh, band tailing, but the disorder provides a lot of copper on zinc involved in the formation energy of uh, detrimental defects. Um, I would like to thank my former boss, uh, Susanne Zibentritz, and my uh, former co-worker at uh, Laboratory for Photovoltaics at the University of Luxembourg. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, researcher at IMRA Europe, Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, and Ulrich uh, Research Center for collaboration. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Oh, very interesting work, very, um, very good um, detailed study. I noticed that the, uh, the alloy, the sulphide um, selenide alloy, um, has quite a big, uh, a very different effect um, on the modification of the um, band tailing than the, uh, the pure selenide. Does yeah. the, the, the selen selenium and sulphur would also have some sort of order or disorder effect on their sublattice? Um, does that uh, disorder or order have any effect on the, on the effect on band tailing? Uh, yes, it does. So, um, so actually, so if you compare uh, here sigma for uh, the alloy with and pure uh, selenide, you see that it's higher, and it's partially due to a uh, disorder of uh, sulfur and selenide, and it's also due to the fact that. Um, Actually, the defect complex in the pure sulfide compound, they have a higher impact on the band gap than for the pure selenide compound. So you have a, a, a mix of these uh, two effects that increase the uh, band tailing for the, the uh, sulfur selenide compound. So, in a, so when you tune the band, you mentioned at the beginning, you can tune the band gap uh, with the sulfur and selenium content. Um, that would be modified by the uh, if its effect on the zinc copper um, order disorder as well. If you're trying to tune the band gap for um, yes, yes, sure. But this this uh, this uh, change in band gap, you can uh, uh, really uh, tune it um, by controlling the cooling of your sample below the critical temperature. Patrick. I uh, know Gavin asked the question I was going to, so thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, so for this graph, it means for the sulfur rich CDPS, the disorders have lower movement energy, right? So this indicator should have a lower uh, VOC deficit, right? Uh, yes, but also, yeah, I haven't put the, the uncertainty. So uh, you see a small change, but for if you look at, at more sample, then sometimes you don't see the change, change. So it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to estimate um, if this is real or not. It's, it's probably within uncertainty. And also, why the order and the disorder changed? The doping of the city has changed a lot. Because you're doing an institute order, the yeah. doping is very high. But if you're doing a disorder, some other, the doping is much lower. Yeah, so uh, the difference between the, the two uh, sample series I, I uh, present, here yeah, first, um, between those two uh, different series, you have the slightly different composition. So this is why uh, one is higher, higher depth than the other one. Uh -huh. And okay. also it's, it's really, uh, if you just look at this uh, copper on zinc and zinc on copper, uh, defect complex. One is a uh, donor, the other one is an acceptor. So if you just uh, play, uh, just change those two uh, uh, atoms, um, they you should not expect any change in the doping density. Actually, uh, have you checked the sodium? Because if you exercise some heat on the sample, the sodium profile is quite different because the sodium is very crucial for the doping of CDFS. Yeah. Have you checked the no, seams? We, we haven't checked. Maybe because of the sodium content is quite different. Yeah, sure. 
But there is the definitely uh, uh, some irreversibility involved in this uh, change in doping mechanism. So it's, it's not due to uh, copper zinc order disorder. Other questions? Okay. Uh, German is here for another two or three years, so if you have more <laughs> questions, just go to speak with him. He's in level one. Uh, let's thank German again for great work. Thank you.